I want to do is talk about evidence-based medicine. Um, there's an awful lot to be said about evidence-based medicine and there's an awful lot being said about it but um, what I want to put into the frame is something which isn't being said enough at the moment. In 1976, two very uh, successful and well-respected medics were making a tour in New Zealand. One of these was called Kerr White and he was about to address a group of clinicians in a big city hospital when he noticed, as he says, their staid and stuffy composure. He suddenly decided that he did not want to startle them, so he fudged his statistics a little bit and said this, about 15 to 20 percent of clinicians interventions are supported by objective evidence that they do more good than harm. It's quite complicated but what he wanted to say was only about 10 to 15 percent of physicians interventions are supported by objective evidence that they do more good than harm. Now, those statistics are drawn from a survey carried out in 1963 where 12 GPs from a northern industrial town recorded their expectations as they made their prescriptions over the course of two weeks' work. They categorised their actions in the following way. Those prescriptions expected to have the specific benefit intended, 9.3% of prescriptions. Those that they expected to have a probable benefit, 22.8%. And those with a possible benefit, 27.2%. Those for which they were only hopeful, 28%. 8.9% 8 were prescribed for their placebo effect and 3.6% simply defied any kind of expectation at all. So the context of these statistics helps to give an idea of the truth value of their work. 12 GPs practicing and prescribing medications over a two week period in 1963. You can probably get your bearings from that and you can probably make a sound judgement on the statistics once you know where it's from. Now the second man on that trip was a man called Archie L. Cochrane and he is really the star of the show. He and his pal White seem to have been modest men who wanted people to know that they were aware of their limitations, that they did not possess the secret of life or death and that they were obliged to exercise their judgement against enormous uncertainty. I'd say that, modest or not, Cochrane and White were doing an important job and that they deserve our respect. They probably deserve their reward as well from the contemporaries and from society in general. Other people seem to have a different conclusion, however, that doctors are quacks and charlatans and really don't know what they are doing. If only 10% of their decisions are based on certainty, some say, then what? Are they lazy? I think in between those two takes, conclusions, there are many different questions that can be asked about how doctors and people can understand illness better. Why doctors must work in the dark. These questions have in fact led to many different kinds of ideas, sometimes involving statistics, sometimes anthropology, sometimes psych psychoanalysis, psychosomatics, psychology, sociology and sometimes even poetry to help understand why people get ill. In the 1970s it led Archie Cochrane to write about randomised controlled trials. Now in the last 10 years or so, maybe 10 or 20, the flourishing arts and humanities have suffered a baffling defeat. It's as if they've been struck down by some mysterious plague. 
Suddenly, and apparently out of nowhere, randomised controlled trials have been declared the gold standard for all kinds of medical research. And at the same time, uh, sociology of science and medicine, in this country at least, has dwindled and psychoanalysis has all but vanished out of sight. There's a lot more to say about this, but for the moment I think it's important that we stay with Archie Cochrane. When he wrote his book in 1972, Efficiency or Effectiveness and Efficiency, when he wrote his book, he found that he had said all he wanted to say after the first couple of chapters, but he was obliged, however, to pad it out and fill up the required number of pages. While he was writing those last few chapters, he became very depressed. He had been asked to do the impossible. He was asked to come up with a solution to the problem of medical knowledge, 90% of medical knowledge, on a national and ideological scale. He probably knew it was impossible, but for some reason he couldn't give it up. He was being asked to move from the particular to the general, from the practice of medicine to the management of medicine, and on a national political scale. I think it's Archibald's Achilles' heel. He is an idealist. He's a man of action, always aiming beyond his limit, and it's really this which makes him heroic and makes him a lovable character. In the 1930s, Archibald L. Cochrane fought on the side of the International Brigade in the Spanish Civil War. He also went to Vienna and began a training analysis. Disappointed by both of those experiences, he then returned to the medical research and joined the Royal Army, because of course it was the time of the Second World War. He was captured quite quickly in Crete and spent four years as a prisoner of war. He was awarded the MBE for that work as a POW medical officer. And this is a quote from his book. There were about 20,000 POWs in the camp, of whom a quarter were British, he said. The diet was about 600 calories a day, and we all had diarrhoea. In addition, we had severe epidemics of typhoid, diphtheria, infections, jaundice, and sand fly fever, with more than 300 cases of pitting edema above the knee. To cope with this, we had a ramshackle hospital, some aspirin, some antacid, and some skin antiseptic. The only real assets, he said, were some devoted orderlies, mainly from the Friends Field Ambulance Unit. Under the best conditions, one would have expected hundreds to die, he goes on, from the diphtheria alone, in the absence of specific therapy. In point of fact, there were only four deaths, of which three were due to gunshot wounds inflicted by the Germans. So, what explains that extraordinary survival rate? Is it spirit, do you think? or should we speak of love? Archie Cochrane certainly inspires love from his fellows and he certainly invokes love for his country. He can nurture a desire for survival but he can also get sidetracked by big impossible ideals. <laughs>